Medicine and the Bible. It's not a topic we discuss very often, but today on the podcast we'll talk poop, pus, and all kinds of things that'll make me want to vomit all over my microphone. You'll want to hear this, uh, the conversation, not the vomit part. Uh, Okay, just roll the open. Welcome to Digging Deeper, the podcast where we talk about the geography, archaeology, people, and cultures of the land of the Bible. By exploring those areas, we hope to broaden your understanding of the biblical narrative. You can learn more about all of us here at Appian Media and watch our free video series at www.appianmedia.org. Before we start today, let me talk just for a second about our sponsor, Memo Marketing. Recently, Appian Media had teamed with Memo Marketing to update our website as well as provide a number of other marketing ideas to help us promote what we're doing. We're happy to have them on board, and we'll say a little bit more about them later on in the program. All right. This episode of Digging Deeper is going to be a little bit different because I'm going to turn most of the talking over to my my cohort here, Dan. Uh, We want to talk on this episode about um, medicine in the Bible. Uh, Dan has an extensive background of uh, medical knowledge, uh, so much so that uh, it'll be very obvious as we go through this episode uh, who the expert is and who's just along for the ride. That's me. I'm just along for the ride here because uh, my medical knowledge is, is, if if it can't be solved with Tylenol, then I'm pretty much out of the picture. Now, I think you have two or three different uh, over-the-counters that you use. Okay, well, I have raised kids, so we've had to do some, we've had to learn some crazy things. But, uh, okay, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, set the stage here for the rest of the show. Uh, Well, uh, I got my associates at Florida College, and I finished my bachelor's at Auburn, and that's where medical training starts. You go to medical school, it's going to be four years of training. You graduate, you have an MD, you hang it on your wall. That's all it's good for. You got to do more training. Um, and so I did three years of internal medicine uh, training, and then I wanted to specialize even further. So I did three more years to get my hematology and my medical oncology fellowship. And then I also did a year of hospice and palliative medicine. Wow. So I added it up the other day, and actually, 17 years after high school, I actually got my first quote unquote real job after all that training. Okay, wow. Uh, yeah, that's, that's amazing. And to, and to be totally honest with you, it's really impressive to me, uh, all the medical doctors that I know personally, the ones I've dealt with with my own personal life and things like that. I really do appreciate all of the schooling and the the training that you go through to do the important things that you do in life. Well, that and don't forget our spouses who basically yeah. helped and sacrificed all that time to get us through it's it's a team effort that's right well okay so you mentioned the 17 years that you know all those training everything that you've gone through but has it been like that forever i mean i mean long time ago what what did how did people learn about medicine well let me uh, i guess let me go in in reverse Uh, modern medical education really changed about 1910 Uh, Abraham Flexner authored the Flexner Report, and he basically just lambasted the American medical education (laughs) system. Yeah. And he said, we need to have a lot more requirements for getting in and a lot more requirements for graduating. And so about half the schools actually closed or merged. Wow. Prior to that time, there were a variety of universities, colleges, um, different schools, but mainly it was a lot of apprenticeships that were done. And so... If we go back to the New Testament times, uh, during the New Testament times, if you were a really well-to-do Roman, you had your own personal Greek physician. Greek (laughs) physicians were were known for being uh, the best. And so Galen uh, set up a lot of theories, and he was the world-renowned doctor at the time, so much so that for 1,300 years, people were following his theories and, and his thoughts on the human body and medicine. Prior to him... You have Hippocrates, who, if you think about the Hippocratic Oath, well, that comes from him. I've heard of that. He lived in the 4th to 5th century BC, and he was really kind of the the forerunner of what we call uh, the father of medicine. So he kind of started modern medicine. But during the Old Testament period, though, what's interesting is it wasn't Greek because that really did, they didn't exist as a huge nation. It was Egyptians. Right. The famous historian Herodotus 
described King Darius, if you remember the Medo-Persian yeah. Empire. Right. He kept in attendance certain Egyptian doctors who had the reputation for the highest eminence in their profession. Xenophon, another uh, ancient historian, mentioned that Cyrus was serviced by an Egyptian doctor. Okay. And even Homer in his Odyssey stated that in Egypt, men are more skilled in medicine than in any other art. Wow. Okay. Well, let me pull on that thread just a minute because you mentioned the, the Egyptian doctors. Now, we know, especially regarding the Old Testament, now we know Joseph, of course, was sold as a slave down into Egypt, and the family lived there for a while. Uh, and then, of course, Moses led them out. What, is there anything about them living down there in Egypt that may have contributed to some of the medicine that we read about in the Old Testament. Well, that's a great thought, and a lot of people will look to the Bible and then look to the Egyptians and say, you know, probably Moses um, got medical information or got a lot of information um, for whatever he talked about um, and wrote down in the Pentateuch. They say, well, he just borrowed from the Egyptian texts that he had down there. Now, what's interesting is in uh, Acts 7, we are told that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Mm, and right. so, you know, obviously, smart man, because as you're raised by Pharaoh's daughter, you're going to have access to the best teachers. While the Bible is not a medical textbook, um, we can look to it and see that Moses, while he was trained in all the wisdom, he didn't seem to follow his teachers in a lot of what he set up that would be medically related. Okay. In Exodus uh, 15, 26, the Israelites were told that if they follow and do all the commands that God had set up, that he would not bring on them the diseases of the Egyptians. And so, obviously, Moses is probably doing something a little different. And there are some great examples of that. All right. So, for example, a lot of uh, civilizations, Egyptians included, used uh, excrement in a oh. lot of their prescription. Okay, go ahead. It, it goes down to the gutter sometimes. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, but we have the Ebers papyrus that was found, and it had 811 uh, prescriptions. And so some of the prescriptions are quite shocking. Like if you wanted to draw out a splinter, well, what would you put on it to get the splinter out? Well, worm's blood, mole, and donkey dung. Oh, should I be taking notes or something here? Yeah, I don't, well, okay. this is what not to do. Okay, all right. Um, one of the prescriptions for some skin diseases involved using a hog's tooth, cat stung, dog stung, and you basically put it on. I'm not sure if that really helped much, but it, it probably kept the doctor in business. Okay. All right. Uh, if you had sore eyes, you have to find the urine of a faithful wife. Not an unfaithful one, but a faithful wife. Oh, okay. Um, there were other uh, prescriptions that would use farmer's urine, hog dung, um, excrement of a child. And so they... We, we call it excrement uh, pharmacology, you know, where you're, you're putting this on and using it as a drug. And the reason they did that is pus was actually valued. They thought it was a great idea. So you would in, basically induce infection because you wanted to see pus. Now we know that pus is because your white cells are there trying to fight the infection from the excrement you just put on it. Of course, it. of course. And so you wonder how many patients died trying to get good pus so that they could get healed. It just... It wasn't great medical uh, care. And so, but even think about uh, civilization 500 years ago. What did we do with our excrement? Well, you threw it in the streets. That's yeah, I, why I wasn't around 500 years ago, but I'm going to take your word for it on this. Okay, well, uh, we, we won't ask some of the, the okay. people who know you because they, right. they accuse both of us of being the old guys here. Okay, that's right. That's why gentlemen walked on one side of the road than the other. So when they threw the excrement out into the street, it would hit you rather than the woman you were excluding. Oh, okay. Um, little known facts. I'm about sure they the appreciated chivalries. that. Yeah. But uh, so the Israelites, though, in Deuteronomy 22, what were they told to do with their excrement? Do you remember? I, they were take it outside the camp or. Right. Exactly. OK. Take it outside and bury it. Oh, OK. Yeah. And the reason they were told was basically because I, the Lord, walk through your midst and I need the camp to be holy. So God kind of said, well, I want it to be holy. I don't want to step in it when I walk through it. Right. But okay. there was a medical reason for yeah. that as well. It minimized the spread of germs. You think about how many, uh, especially with a closed camp with the th hundreds of thousands of people they had, you could have something just run through the entire camp really quickly. All right. And it prevented a lot of epidemics by bearing their waste, which is unusual for yeah. the time. Yeah. Moses didn't learn that in Egypt. Right. He learned it somewhere else. Just another thought about the sanitation is the fact that in Numbers 19, after handling a dead body, that person was considered unclean, and they would have to be apart from people for at least a week. 
and on day three and day seven they would use running water or water of purification can dead bodies spread disease well we know now sure. they do but even uh, if we think about 3300 years after Moses so uh, Dr. Semmelweis in Austria he was an obstetrician and they had an 18 percent death rate in their their mothers from basically fever and they would have raging infection oh, right and he discovered though he got to looking this is in the medical field with the medical students and all the doctors checking them if they delivered by a midwife the death rate was only three percent oh. it's a big difference and he got to investigating and what he realized is the medical students would do autopsies on the women who had died of these infections and then they would go and just kind of rinse their hands in a bowl of bloody water that everybody else had rinsed their hands in they would use a common towel and they would go immediately do internal examinations oh, right. on the live patients yeah not the best idea no not at all no okay all right this this podcast is called digging deeper and we've actually gone a little, a little bit deeper deep. on that subject <laughs> than i really wanted to go so let's 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 turn the tables a little bit let's talk about water okay I mean, and water and purification and things like that so what do we know about that well actually numbers 19 describes and gives the prescription for the waters of purification okay and it's a list of really weird things ashes of a red heifer uh hyssop cedar scarlet wool why would you put all those together it's just kind of seems hocus pocus right. but i think if you look at them individually you can see there was a lot of thought and a lot of knowledge that went into it in this country now you need soap just go to the store and buy it right the pioneers had to make their own soap and so what did they normally make they would make lye soap all right do you know how to make lye soap? I do not, actually. Okay. I have no idea. Well, I don't either, but I've read about it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, for lye soap, you would involve taking ashes, and you would mix them with fat while pouring water through them. Okay. So, you would involve running water, fat, and ashes to make lye soap. And so, we already have some of the ingredients right there for a primitive soap. Hyssop has known to have antiseptic uh, uh, characteristics. And so here's yet another kind of an antibacterial or antiseptic. And then cedar also has been found to have a lot of antiviral and anti-inflammatory antibacterial properties. And then the scarlet wool, it was probably from wool, but scarlet, um, those fibers would have made it almost like a lava soap. Okay. So you have an ancient bar of lava soap here, you know, that, that is being used to help purify the person who has touched a dead body. Similar to Semmelweis telling people that they had to start washing their hands with an antiseptic. Same thing here, 3,300 years before, Moses is instructing people who have dealt with dead bodies to use this primitive soap. Right. Okay. So the so what you're saying is that the the all of the ingredients that Moses talked about in Numbers, the 19th chapter, on how to deal with this situation, we, we kind of use the same things now because we've learned that the items that Moses mentioned were absolutely vital to keeping things purified oh absolutely we are so smart today because we've discovered this but here 3300 years prior to people discovering it 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 was already discovered right it was okay. already mentioned all right i actually have a couple more questions for you uh, about the dietary laws and things like that uh but before we get to that oh, let's take a break and talk about our sponsor all right, we want to take a quick break and tell you a little bit about our sponsor, Memo Marketing. They're a full-service marketing company specialized in web design, strategic marketing, social media management. Uh, they build apps and do a whole lot more things. In fact, when we got ready to upgrade our website uh, for Appian Media, we called on Matt and his team over at Memo Marketing. Uh, they jumped right in and were do was able to do everything we needed for them. Yeah, they have really transformed how our website looks and the way that our fundraising is done. Uh, we have a new fundraising model that they helped uh, us to think about, and it has really changed and made us more sustainable. So let me tell you, if you're looking for a company to do some strategic marketing to grow your business, uh, I encourage you to check out Memo Marketing. You can learn more about them at memomarketinggroup.com. That's memomarketinggroup.com. Okay. Now back to the program. All right, Dan, let's continue this. Uh, I really don't want to go down uh, the same path that we went down there in the first part of the show. That just took a turn that I wasn't expecting. But 
we, we may risk that again a little bit because I want to ask you a little bit about the dietary laws that we read about uh, in the Old, Old Testament. Is there any relationship between um, the instructions that God gave the people of Israel and the medical benefits that may have been a result thereof? I think there is a medical benefit, but stepping back, I think really the dietary laws were put in place to tell the children of Israel to distinguish between what was holy and non-holy or clean and unclean. Right. And so it really was to teach them that principle for God. But medically, if you have a people traveling through a desert with little running water, not much wood for cooking things well, uh, these laws do have multiple medical benefits. And so I think God, through Moses, set these up. Now, they didn't have all these randomized clinical control trials that we do today. Okay, right. And didn't have epidemiologists and microbiologists. So either, in my mind, this is from God, or Moses just got extremely lucky on multiple fronts. Yeah. But, uh, for example, and now I, I hate to bring this up. Because Here we go again. I know Jet loves his reptiles. Right. Oh, yeah. But reptiles, about 90% of them out there have salmonella. Okay. The mammals can carry it, but it's, the rate's a lot lower. Right. And so when God said, you know, don't even, don't eat them, but he said, even if they've they've landed on something, you know, you, that's considered unclean. Right. And contamination can be spread by things that the reptile has touched. Not even from the reptile, you touching it, but just touching something it has been on. Right. And so Leviticus... uh 11 um, in the 30s mentions the fact that that vessel is unclean and we need to need to do something about it. Another example, shellfish, one of my favorite things to eat. Yeah. That was not something the Jews could eat. Okay. And well, why? Well, God said so. But <laughs> medically, if you don't cook shellfish well, you can get some nasty infections. And if you have a little bit of medical problems, there's a certain infection that the shellfish uh, tend to carry called Vibrio vulnificus, that if you get that infection, it can actually be fatal. All right. And so if you can't cook it well, don't even eat it. All right, okay. Um, and then the classic one for Jewish people is do they eat pork? Oh, right. I was, about, like, I, was about, oh, I was wondering if we were going to get there. We are. Bacon, one of my favorite things. Oh, yeah. Um, that's the hard part about going over to Israel, yep. is you're bacon-free for a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. I, I don't operate well in that situation, but... Pigs eat just about anything, and as a result, they carry a lot of parasites. Oh, okay. And so there are a number of infections that, if you're going to eat pork, you have to make sure it is cooked very well. Right. Um, otherwise, you're going to get it. And so toxoplasmosis is one of them, tapeworms, and then trichinosis is probably the classic one that people think of if they think about eating bad pig right. and getting an infection. And so you can avoid all of that just by not eating them. Right. There was an interesting study done in the 50s uh, by David um, Mack at Johns Hopkins where he was growing saplings, but he took juice from different animal meats and mixed it in with the um, with the fertilizer, and he basically rated meat on its toxicity. Does this have any meaning to us? I have no idea. You're but right. It was interesting because when he looked at clean versus unclean animals, whether it was birds, fish, or mammals, the ones that were considered unclean by the law of Moses actually had a much higher toxicity rate, and the saplings had a harder time growing than use of juice from a clean meat. And so, I don't know if it means anything, but it was just one of those intriguing okay. studies yeah. you run across. Okay. All right. I got two more quick questions for you. One has to do with the fact that we read, of course, in the, in the Law of Moses, about their instruction to circumcise their males. What's the medical benefit there that we read about uh, from the Old Testament uh, dr direction that was given to the people? Well, uh, with that, once again, um, it was set up. It was set there. Right. Not for medical reasons uh, is what we're told. Right. It was a sign of the covenant. But interestingly, males who are circumcised, when they are very young, their rate of bladder infections and urinary tract infections is much lower. When they get older, their risk of cancer, so penile cancer and a lot of sexually transmitted diseases, is reduced by being circumcised. But the cool thing about it is when did God say – to Abraham that he needed to circumcise the children. It was on the eighth day. Eighth day. On the eighth day. Didn't matter if it was on the Sabbath during the time of uh, law of Moses, right. they still circumcised. Well, you need enough clotting factors so you don't bleed 
really any time a surgical procedure is done. Right. And so for newborns, when they are born, um, according to the whole pediatric textbook, prothrombin, which is a substance that helps you clot, the day you're born, you have about 90% of the total number that you should have. But that drops down to about 35%. And then it starts rising after about the third day to the point that on the eighth day, you're actually at 110%. So you're actually oh, higher than you normally would be. Yeah. So the eighth okay. day seems to be pretty good. The other thing is vitamin K helps your body make clotting factors. It's manufactured in the intestines. Right. That really doesn't kick in until day three to five. And so really, you have to wait at least until day five for things to be safe. And then the eighth day seems to be kind of the optimal okay. time. Right. Okay. All right. So let me ask one more question. Um, obviously, uh, the the difference in medical knowledge here between you and me is dramatic. Um, but uh, let, is there anything else that as you've read through the Bible during your study that really kind of jumps out at you from a medical perspective? That 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 interests you. How long is this podcast again? Oh, uh, no, we got to end in a few minutes here. Yeah. Um, so, well, uh, thinking about it, one thing, uh, Psalm one thirty nine is one of those uh, fascinating things where it talks about kind of being formed in the womb, and uh, one of my favorite uh, things about reading that is it mirrors some of what I've studied uh, in medical school. So the, there's a couple words. One is my frame. Because the the verse says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret places. The word frame or substance is the Hebrew word golem, which means to wrap or to fold. Okay. When you study embryology, you realize that all these tissues, there's tons of different foldings and wrappings that happen as they develop. Okay. And then the other, uh, the second part of that passage in uh, Psalm 139.15 says, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. And when you do histology and you're looking at the microscope at tendons and ligaments and muscles and how they come together, they are truly woven in an interlacing pattern. Okay. It's just fascinating that the words that they choose in Psalms, and then when you look at them on a microscopic level, somebody seemed to know right, exactly. what was going on. Exactly. But probably the biggest one, uh, lastly, is the sexual laws that God laid out. The Bible is very unique in the sexual mores that it lines. Right. Uh, at the time it was written, yeah. as well as even today, if you look at culture and what is acceptable, mm -hmm. um, the Bible basically says a man and a woman are to get married, no sexual intercourse until marriage, and then only with each other after marriage. And religiously, even for a lot of religions, that is unique. Right. Um, today's culture tells us if it feels good, do it. Right. And God says, if it feels good within marriage, I want you to do it. Actually, between a man and a wife, that is a beautiful thing. Right. Song of Solomon goes through that. But medically, if we follow God's commands, what would happen? Most unplanned pregnancies would be gone. Right. Pretty much all STDs would be wiped out. Now, obviously, there could be some certain circumstances. but Exactly. Um, but we would limit HIV. We would... Uh, to just things like blood transmission, if somebody's donating blood, we would stop cervical cancer, anal cancer, and penile cancers right. by doing what God said. And so Moses and the other writers of the Bible were inspired by God to lay down these moral laws that had many health benefits. And it just took us thousands of years to really realize what the benefits are. It's fascinating. Yes. The Bible is not a medical textbook. But those of us in the medical world can read it, and we can definitely see the health benefits in following God's instructions. Occasionally, we'll view the reason for the instructions and say, oh, it was because of the medical benefits. But while those instructions are beneficial, that's not the primary reason for them. Just like the dietary laws, I feel that they were given to the Jews at Mount Sinai for the health benefits for people traveling through a desert. But the main goal was to have them focus on being holy and differentiating between clean and unclean. There are many other stipulations about things in their lives that help them focus on being sanctified, focus on being set apart. And just like them, today we can look at the laws that God has set up. And we can either be upset and feel restricted, or we can rejoice because there's so many benefits by following those laws, health included. And so we might not even realize till much later those benefits. God is calling us to be holy 
and His regulations for us are designed with that in mind. We are to focus on living holy lives as we are set apart by God. As His disciples and children, our joy should be in pleasing Him. Digging Deeper is a production of Appian Media. We're a nonprofit media production company that's 100% crowdfunded. If you're interested in learning more about how you can support Appian Media so that we can continue to create great free content, visit us at appianmedia.org slash digging deeper. If you'd like to reach out to either Dan or myself, you can reach us at dan.kingsley at appianmedia.org or barry.brittnell at appianmedia.org. We'd love to hear from you and answer any questions that you may have. A special thanks goes out to Craig and Stuart and Jet, who've helped us put this episode together for all of you. And of course, thanks always goes to our generous donors who make this podcast possible. Uh, you can join us next time. Dan's going to turn the tables a little bit. He's going to ask me a number of questions about weather. That's where uh, my background is. And so Dan's going to uh, pepper me with questions about that and how it relates to the land and the stories of the Bible. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Until then, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to being with you on the next episode of Digging Deeper. Digging Deeper.